Myself and my co-authors who've come down today, Louise Heathwaite, who I'm sure many of you know here, um, Sim Rini, who's doing technical stuff, and Dave Millage, just there. Uh, and Lucy Dugdale, who is a PhD student linked to the project, but who's now um, working at the Eden Rivers Trust. Um, I think this has been quite an interesting experience for us over the last five or six years. It's been a collective effort um, through which we've been trying to take quite a different approach to the way we think about agricultural catchments. Um, and what I want to do today is give you a very general overview of what SIMAP is about, focusing on its philosophical basis, what it's trying to achieve, rather than the detail technical uh, underpinning. Although I will give you a flavor for what I mean by technical underpinning when I give you some examples of how we've used um, best practice current understanding in science to inform the technical detail. Um, I want to start off by saying a little bit about um, what um, SIMAP uh, is not and what it is. Um, what SIMAP is not. SIMAP is not a water quality model like SIMCAT, and you'll see why it's not a water quality model in a moment. It's not, a, it's not a conventional rainfall runoff model that you might use in flood risk studies, such as the flood estimation handbook rainfall runoff model. What it is, is really captured on that right-hand slide there. And that's a, that's a, a, a map of field boundaries um, for part of the River Eden catchment in Cumbria. And you can see some colored lines on there. And the colored lines are SIMAP output. And red is bad, uh, blue is good. And that captures what SIMAP is trying to do. It's trying to inform you as to where in your catchment you've got tributaries and ultimately fields and ultimately bits of fields that might be producing risk, however you want to think about what that risk might be. And that depends on how SIMAP is formulated. So when we set out to develop SIMAP, and I'll say more about this uh, later on, we took a very explicit framing that what we were trying to do was to produce a tool that could be used to prioritize what to do where in an agricultural catchment, and potentially at quite small scales. And you'll see that when I come on to it uh, uh, in a moment. So what it is then is a risk-based model. We think of catchments as producing risk. Catchments accumulate that risk as it flows down into the drainage network. We emphasize that risk in general is relative. One bit of a catchment might be riskier than another. And what we're worried about is when we have a known problem, where those risks are likely to be coming from. It's a bit like a searching tool. You've got your known problem downstream. Well, where's that coming from? And central then, uh, thirdly, to, to what SIMAP is, is a minimum information requirement analysis. This is a, a tool that can be used with readily available data rather than requiring you to embark upon uh, expensive data acquisition campaigns. And as such, it's a profiling tool. As with all models, the only thing you can really do with a model is show that it's wrong. But what SIMAP tells you to, or aims to do is to show you where to look first, knowing that because of the simplifications and the assumptions in it, it will inevitably not give you a full story, a full history. But when you're dealing with these very, very large, spatially extensive, complicated agricultural catchments, and you look, look at all the layers of complexity, it's about saying, where do you go first? Where do you prioritize your scarce resources? Where do you start to look? Where are the risks most likely to be found? So, what is SIMAP then? What does it do? Well, central to SIMAP is the idea that most, most of you, particularly as a regulatory organization, most of the time on the ground, you will know where your problems are, either because you'll be picking them up through uh, routine water quality monitoring, or because you've got at the end of a phone some very irate angling club saying the river's a right old mess uh, and something needs to be done about it. So the idea is, is that if you know where your problem is, the challenge becomes to find out what's causing it. 
whether it's the source, and you can see here a field which is producing, in this case, some kind of fine sediment risk associated with what we would call, what a term Louise came up with, spatially restricted critical source areas. Certain parts of the landscape are more likely to be the sources of risk than other parts of the landscape. But also, we have to think about the pathways. Can that risk actually reach a watercourse? And you see there a rill on a field. Um, it's flowing downhill uh, into the picture. And you can see a little depression there that's capturing the soil. Now, that picture shows you that whilst the farmer has a problem, because he or she has a, a rill in their field, the river doesn't have a problem because the soil that's being eroded is being, eroded is being trapped in the field. So in other words, whilst that might be risky in one sense to the farm, it's not necessarily risky to the river. But we've got to capture that kind of effect, the landscape's filtering effect. Likewise, we know that rivers have some power, some natural power, to effectively dilute. Here you see a, a muddy stream mixing with a clear water stream. When those two are mixed, there would have been some dilution. So when we think about risk, we've got to recognize that the routing of risk can be imperfect, as in that uh, soil erosion there. It's difficult to get that eroded soil into the river. As you follow a pathway, the risk can be transformed because of biological and chemical processes. And thirdly, river basins, of course, are arterial, and that's the dilution effect. And that's really what SIMAP is trying to capture for each of these processes according to the impact, because for the processes that matter, uh, or for a, given, for a given impact, you have to reformulate the exact nature of the processes you use. So for a given impact, you formulate your processes using minimum information requirements, and on the basis of that, you say, how do I then intervene? Recognizing that if you are going to intervene in a cost-effective manner, you don't want to end up having to necessarily change great swathes of land use uh, across the country. You want to focus it on those bits of the catchment that are both generating the risk, the sources, where those risks can be delivered through the drainage network uh, in ways that matter. And that's the overall uh, philosophy of the SIMAP model. By thinking about sources and pathways, in relation to a particular impact, it's possible to generate more intelligent, more cost-effective uh, solutions. And I guess that the opportunity there, and what we're trying to exploit, is the possibility that diffuse pollution is not truly diffuse. Extending the critical source area concept to include pathways, and recognizing that certain parts of the landscape are more able to produce and deliver risk than others. And that's, if, if you can exploit that opportunity in an agricultural landscape, you can do it in ways that allow you to target resources to the places where they're going to have most uh, impact. So in terms of the history then, SIMAP actually began as a collaboration between uh, Durham University and Lancaster in 2004. And the, the two broad histories to this project um, are on those uh, boxes on the left. Um, I, uh, you should say, where it says Leeds Durham, I moved from Leeds to Durham as SIMAP was set up, and at the same time, Louise moved from Sheffield to Lancaster, although SIMAP's are now a, a fully Durham Lancaster uh, initiative. It was funded under what's called the NERC Connect scheme. And the NERC Connect scheme is what NERC calls its knowledge transfer scheme. And what that means is that it was a project set up jointly with a series of um, government NGO type partners. I'll say more about that in a moment. We brought to it, in fact, it was, it was really a, a direct outcome of a previous NERC project from my perspective, looking at in relation to the Upper Wharfdale Best Practice Project, where we were looking at sensitive agricultural catchments and trying to understand them hydrologically in ways that you could then intervene to, uh, to manage them in a more sensible way. Uh, and in particular, Liz Chalk, who some of you may know, was instrument, instrumental in, in asking a simple question to me, which was, well, it's all very well telling me uh, that, that, that you can model this system, but what do I do where? And where should I go first in terms of, in this case, blocking uh, upland drains? Louise, in particular, brought her experience from a, a long series of projects with DEFRA, um, particularly the phosphorus indicator tool uh, and PEDAL, and now the second uh, uh, round of uh, PEDAL funding, 
And we brought those together uh, under SIMAP. Uh, and in the first phase of the project, with a series of partners, we had a small amount of funding from DEFRA. Uh, we had some indirect funding from the Environment Agency, both the science team and the Northeast uh, region. And importantly, and it turned out to be extremely important uh, in the early phases of development of SIMAP, strong links with the Association of Rivers Trusts uh, and also with the uh, Eden Rivers Trusts. And that was really the first phase of SIMAP. And then about 18 months ago, we embarked on the second phase, which was funded by the Environment Agency Science Team and the Catchment Sensitive Farming uh, Program. Uh, and it's really that, that that's brought us here uh, today. Um, but we've also been doing some outreach work with SIMAP to some of the Rivers Trusts. And those are just some of the Rivers Trusts following from the Eden Rivers Trust that are now using SIMAP as part of their uh, 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 farm management planning and so on. We've, we've used to do this, it's been, uh, we, I sometimes say SIMAP is done on the cheap. Uh, it's cost us about 240K of money. That's money that's actually been spent in Lancaster and Durham to do the project. Um, there's then a hidden cost, which is the help we've received from the Environment Agency in particular, uh, in terms of provisions of data and so on uh, as part of the project. It's also worth saying early on that our philosophy is very much open but controlled access. We want people to use the models that we've been producing, um, but we need to know how they're being used and in what ways they're being used so we can make sure they're being used in the right way. Because it's very tempting with some of the visual output from SIMAP to say, oh, wow, this, is, this, is, this looks really good, without understanding that you might have applied SIMAP in the wrong way or to the wrong type of catchment. So that's our our broad um, philosophy, um, open access without charge, uh, but controlled. So what is the rationale behind SIMAP? Well, I've picked on some of this uh, uh, already. Firstly, finite resources and targeting. If you've got a finite pot of money and you want to use that money to best effect in an agricultural landscape, or if intervening in the landscape is going to cost a land manager uh, time and money, you want to make sure that it's been done in the right place. So finite resources is a driver of targeting. Second philosophy, as I've mentioned already, is to start with the problem and then to work out where in the catchment that problem is going to be coming from. So start with the problem and then work out where it's coming from. Thirdly, to recognize that the landscape is a very strong filter of risk. The landscape structures risk. What do I mean by that? Well, you've already seen the slide here of the real um, where quite a subtle topographic hollow is structuring the delivery of that risk, in this case, eroding soil to the river system. But more generally, this is a, a slide from the Upper Wharfdale Best Practice Project, where we're modeling in a one in 50 year flood event, um, an upland catchment. Uh, this is the uh, main valley divide. Uh, There's the main, the main channel. These are the divides up here, up here, and around the back here. These dark gray areas are saturated at the peak of the storm. These light gray areas are unsaturated. If you then do some hydrological analysis on that, you can work out where the saturated areas are connected by overland flow to a tributary. And what you see is that despite quite widespread saturation, it's actually only quite small fingers of water running across the surface where there is overland flow connection between the surface uh, and the river channel. And that's what I mean by this structuring, this filtering effect. If you've got risks on those black areas and those risks can be picked up by the water, um, then those risks are likely to get into the water course. In other words, you have to worry more about those connected, saturated areas than you have to worry about the unconnected uh, saturated areas. And of course, whether or not they connect depends on the size of the storm, the duration of the storm, and that's a theme that we'll uh, look at a little bit later. The fourth uh, theme uh, is the importance of accepting what I call epistemic uncertainty. Now, I've gone about Donald Rumsfeld's and known knowns and unknown unknowns and known unknowns. And that's really what we're talking about here. One of the problems that academics, I think, in particular face in 
exploring complex agricultural environments is we frame our models by what we think matters. We decide what processes to put in them. And as an academic, I see that all the time when I see papers saying, oh, we've got to sort out, if we can only sort out tram lines and wheeling lines, uh, we can completely cause uh, uh, salmon populations in the UK to be recovered. And there's, of course, often some legitimate, legitimate interpretation for those individual hypotheses. But our epistemic uncertainty relates from the fact that, in general, we don't know exactly what it is matters in these basins. And somehow, we've got to find out. But as soon as we start modeling and make assumptions and only put certain processes in, we run the risk of excluding processes that might matter. So if you look at something like Atlantic salmon, um, and Atlantic salmon, I guess, is a, it, it, certainly for catchments, you might expect there to be Atlantic salmon in. The Atlantic salmon is a wonderful example of a biological indicator of the health of a river because it uses pretty much all of the river during its life cycle. Its populations are declining, but there are 64 hypotheses for that decline. So you face a very, very difficult question as to deciding what to put in your model. You can't put all 64 hypotheses in. So you've therefore got to be intelligent uh, in asking what I think is a very simple but important question, what makes a fish happy? And how can we use the information that we have in our problems, like our, our lack of fish and where there are no fish, where there are fish, in our problems because we've got particularly high levels of a, of a nutrient, say, in our water quality sample, can we use that information more intelligently to work out where risk is in our catchments? And that's been a big part of the, um, the second phase of, of SIMAP with the uh, EA science team. And then finally, and I've mentioned this before, um, the idea that research should be framed by the user, which is one of the reasons why this project has been funded uh, in a collaborative way. Um, and I'll illustrate that for you, uh, again, by contrasting what a modeler normally does uh, with, with uh, a pollution problem. We try and model the landscape to predict the downstream pollution, whereas actually as a regulator, you've got your problem. What you want to know is where it's coming from. And that kind of captures, uh, that image captures what we're really trying to do here, is to reverse the analysis. Um, of course, you can, when you've done the, um, uh, the traditional way, you can sometimes get at that. But our argument is you don't necessarily need to do the traditional way in order to do this, uh, uh, what, what actually the regulatory authority might need. So how do we turn that into practice? Well, here are those five elements of the rationale. Um, we're, we've argued throughout that actually, quite often, risk is structured not just at the field scale, but at the subfield scale. And that's reflected in the fact that there are certain types of parts of fields, for instance, where you might need to have a buffer zone, that interventions in those parts of the fields that might actually cost quite a lot less to the land manager should be the priority of, of, of intervention. So we're trying to get risk down to the subfield scale. We start with a problem, which could be anywhere in the catchment, and then we downscale to progressively smaller scales to try and find out where the problem is most likely to be coming from. And you'll see that in some of the maps I'll show of the when some later. Recognize that landscape structure risks. So we're interested in trying to, for each problem, trying to work out how the source is structured spatially and how the pathways are structured spatially. Develop inverse modeling, so this is where we might use data on fish, I'll give you an example of that later, or data from your GQA database to actually try and inform the kind of uh, uh, parameters that are driving the system. And as I said, working in partnership. So those, if you like, are the five delivery themes that map onto our uh, rationale. Now, these are the versions of SIMAP that we've got at the moment on the left. We have a version for fine sediment, we have a version for phosphorus, uh, we have an inverse version, and an inverse version you effectively uh, say, let's do away with our simple models of sediment and phosphorus, and actually use data to help learn what the form of the model should be. And I flagged up nitrogen. We have done some work on nitrogen, but that's not really got to the point where we're, we're happy or, or, or confident with it. But fine sediment, phosphorus, and inverse uh, are, are all there. In all of these models, they share this structure which is the idea that we need to find at each location in our landscape the risk that something is generated. It could be fine sediment, it could be phosphorus, 
We need to understand for that location, once you've produced risk at that location, how easily can it connect to the river. And that's done on a quite fine resolution, typically 20 meters by 20 meters, um, over up to 3,000 square kilometers. We combine those together to work out how risky that location is. We then route the risk through the catchment to get what we call a risk loading. And of course, as you route risk through the catchment, you're accruing more water, so you're also going to be diluting the risk. So we say we route, we accumulate, and we dilute. And that gives us a risk concentration, which is analogous to a water quality concentration um, dimensionally, although it differs for some important reasons you can perhaps ask me about. Now, when we, if I can uh, illustrate some elements of that for you, I thought I'd do it for fine sediment. Um, what we do with fine sediment is we generate the relative risk of erosion using um, some simplified models for, for things like soil erosion. We connect. Uh, now, because it's fine sediment, we know that the primary routing vehicle for fine sediment is overland flow. And because it's overland flow, that informs the nature of the way we parameterize the connection. So you can see it's the problem that is defining the way we structure the content of the model. That gives us this point scale risk by multiplying the generation risk by the connection risk. And these relative risks are done relative to the catchment area upstream of the point that you're worried about. So if you have a problem, you say, let's look at all of the catchment area upstream, calculate the relative risk of erosion across that catchment, the relative risk of delivery across that catchment, multiply those two together to get the point scale risk across the catchment. We root, we accumulate, and we dilute. Now, how do we handle time? We do make something called an ergodic hypothesis in all of this, which I won't go into. Uh, but I will show you why we can do that in relation to fine sediment uh, in a moment. But the key thing about SIMAP is it allows you to integrate for whatever time period you want. You can, in theory, do it for a storm event, in which case you'd be looking at, in that storm event, the map of, of which parts of the catchment were able to connect and for what duration during that storm event. Or you can do it over many decades by looking at the average amount of time over 30 or 40 years that that point in the catchment uh, is actually connected to the river basin. And both of those are actually quite relevant to fine sediment in different ways according to what catchment you're looking at. All the data that the model needs is available to the Environment Agency digitally, although it, one of the things, and Alistair Maltby may say more about this, is that there are a number of people who would like to use SIMAP who don't have access to all of those data. But as Environment Agency projects, there's, there's no data issues there at all. It takes about a day per 200 square kilometers to set up. Um, once you've set it up, the runs are extremely fast because of the way it's programmed. And central to our uh, approach uh, is minimal parameterization. And the model is designed to be parsimonious um, with the kinds of data you might have to parameter it. I, it's a data, it doesn't require large amounts of field data to actually make the model run. Of course, the consequence of a simplified model um, with minimal data requirements is there are certain things it doesn't predict too well at all. And that's the trade-off that happens with any kind of modeling. Now, to give you an example of one of the nitty-gritty bits of the science in SIMAP, let's look at uh, how we treat connectivity in relation to fine sediment. Well, I've said already we might assume that the primary delivery route for fine sediment is overland flow. Um, we did some work um, as part of the Upper Wolfdale Best Practice Project that actually showed it was quite easy to generalize in the landscape um, those locations that are most likely to be dry in the landscape for longest. So if you've got overland flow and you meet a dry location, you will start to infiltrate. And if you can then get a map of the relative dryness, I where the controlling locations are, then you can actually start to say something about the hydrological structure. So we then had to find a way of doing that. Now, I've illustrated this here uh, in terms of how wet the catchment is. So as you go from dark blue to light green, the catchment is getting uh, wetter. Uh, down on the bottom here, we've got the river channel, labeled CH. 
We've got a wet, potentially floodplain here, so at a level of 14, this is quite wet. And we've got a disconnected wet patch at the top. And of course, as the catchment starts to get wetter, um, the uh, drainage network, the overland flow network might expand till eventually it connects. And that little cell there is, if you like, the dry location that connects or causes the connection by overland flow. So that network there value is very, very important. And you can see that what we do effectively is assign that controlling value to all of the other air cells upstream. I, those cells upstream can only connect and deliver by overland flow uh, when um, this cell here uh, is actually wet enough, i.e. the catchment is wet enough to flux across the surface there. Now, of course, what we then have to do is some tests on that. So these are the kinds of tests that we've done. This is a plot of this thing called the network index uh, against how long uh, 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 each site in the landscape connects it uh, to, 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 to the river. It's based upon a fully physically based distributed hydrological model um, that Simrini has developed called CRUM, and that was used to generate the connection durations that we were able then to test against our much simpler uh, network index. And what you find is that in this system, uh, you generally have to have a network index in the storm event uh, round about here for the connection to actually start. And then there's a, a log linear relationship between connection duration and the network index value. So there's a significant amount of information contained in this very simple network index in relation to uh, overland flow. And that's the philosophy that we've been using for the SIMAP development, is to try to use more complicated models to inform these simpler relationships that are much more readily uh, applicable. Now, in terms of validation, um, give you again for flavor how we, for, for how we've gone about validating SIMAP, this is what a risk map looks like. This is the risk map um, for uh, fine sediments for the River Eden uh, in Cumbria. Blue, low risk. Uh, red uh, is high risk. And what you see in that catchment is a trade-off between two very important parameters. On the one hand, uh, where the slopes uh, are steeper, the risk of producing uh, erodible soil goes up. But on the other hand, farmers uh, will only be farming uh, in terms of land uses that would leave the soil bare for some part of the year. They'll only be doing that provided the slope doesn't get too steep. So there's a bit of a trade-off going there in the risk map. Likewise, there's a trade-off uh, in terms of how easy it is once you've got eroded soil uh, to get that uh, material into the landscape and the kinds of land uses that are found in the catchment. So you're looking at a catchment with a lot of in complex interactions going on. And this is then the ultimate risk map that you get from taking into account those interactions. Red is high risk, uh, blue uh, is low risk. Uh, it shows you, for instance, that in terms of soil erosion, the, uh, for those of you that know the area around uh, Oldswater, which is down here um, in the Lake District, uh, relatively low. These are the North Pennine draining, Pennine Becks. Again, relatively low risk. But some of these areas, which are actually Piedmont slope stroke upland areas down here, um, well, where they've got some topography, are producing much higher levels of risk. So that's the risk map. As part of Lucy Dugdale's PhD, she did some rapid spatial water quality sampling um, using, in this case, an indicator trace of potassium. Um, and what this uh, plot shows is that as our modeled risk goes up, um, so uh, we were picking up more of this tracer. And you can express that in a very sort of slightly different way if I uh, um, get that person. Um, in that all we're plotting there is recorded siltation of riverbed gravels. Uh, the risk uh, of the gravels recorded as containing significant amount of silt uh, in terms of its mean and its standard deviation is greater uh, than without the silt. The other element of the, the validation in the River Eden that I thought I'd mention, because Adrian uh, flagged this up, was we were very keen to work with the Eden Rivers Trust because they've been, like some of the other rivers trusts in, in the UK, pioneering spatially distributed uh, semi-quantitative sampling of salmonid fry, so Atlantic salmon uh, and trout. And that was an alternative way 
to see whether or not our model was picking up risks, in this case, uh, to uh, fish. So this is, these are their uh, uh, maps of uh, uh, classified using uh, the, uh, both an EA and an Irish classification here in terms of how good the recorded fry counts were. And when we look at those, uh, we find that actually they do contain, that the risk signature contains significant amounts of fish information. So if we just look at the uh, 2002 data, we've ranked the, uh, the each fry site into the least risky, and the, uh, sorry, the least risky and the most risky, this is just a probably, probability exceedance curve, this is the number of fry. You can see that throughout the least risky sites, as modeled by SIMAP, have the highest fry counts. Um, in this case, the four next risk classes are not that identifiable. Uh, in 2003, when we repeated it, um, you do get more of that grading from one to two to three to four to five. Um, but generally, it's showing you that where the risk predictions for SIMAP as formulated for fish, in this case uh, for trout fry, uh, where those risk predictions are lower, um, uh, you are getting better uh, fry counts, notwithstanding all the other influences uh, on uh, uh, salmonic populations. A bit about SIMAP inverse. Well, SIMAP inverse um, was applied more extensively. Uh, we've talked generally about the Eden so far, but we applied um, SIMAP in inverse form uh, to all 11 of the uh, CSF uh, catchments listed there. And we characterize the catchments in terms of um, uh, an improved pasture arable index and the base flow index. The base flow index is important because of some of the hydrological assumptions uh, contained uh, in uh, SIMAP. Now, to give you a flavor for what inverse modeling means, I'm going to illustrate it through the River Wenson. Now, this is what a conventional set of SIMAP output looks like for uh, the River Wensum. So what we've got up on the top left there um, is the catchment. Um, the black dots are the GQA sites. The red dots are the additional sites put in by the CSF monitoring. We've got a land cover map, various sorts of land covers. We have quite a bit of urban in, particularly in the downstream part of the uh, Wensum, but mixed uh, horticulture, non-rotational horticulture, and some pasture and grazing uh, in terms of land use. We can get our connectivity risk. We can get our uh, uh, fine sediment risk. So that's the point fine sediment risk. And when we integrate the point, fine, the, the, the point fine sediment risk across the catchment by routing, accumulating, and diluting, we get the risk map. And that's the risk map for the River Wensum. So it's showing you clearly some tributaries, some middle streams producing quite a bit of the risk. We can compare that with. Um, the phosphorus risk map for Wensum, and you find that the parts of the catchment that, that are thought to be producing fine sediment are not necessarily the same ones that are producing phosphorus. And of course, that's because in the phosphorus model, we take into account sources of phosphorus that are not transported along with fine sediment. So you do actually have to think quite carefully about what you want to do in this catchment. What is your problem? Is it fine sediment? Is it phosphorus? Because you have to look in different places according to which uh, kind of risk you've got. The inverse modeling takes us one step further. So here we've got our locations, our GQA data in red, uh, in black, and our CSF locations in red. What we do in the inverse modeling is we say, well, let's run the model many, many times, making as few assumptions as possible about what's creating, say, phosphorus risk or fine sediment risk. So we do multiple runs of the model with different parameter values five or 10 or, or 15, or in this case, 30,000 runs. Once we've got that, we find which of the model runs give us the best agreement with our data. And we've done some checks on the GQA data. And I think that one of the things, I, I know it's true in some of the other, the other um, uh, certainly some of the biological data work that, that, that Sheffield have been doing, when you actually start to look um, at these kinds of data, although they weren't uh, the sites weren't chosen to deliver science information. They were des designed to help things like regulation of, of uh, water treatment works and so on. There is nonetheless a very important signal in these data that you can actually use to train these kinds of models. And that, I think, is quite important because this is a spatial data set, and SIMAP is about understanding the spatial structure of river catchments. Yeah, that should be fine. 
So this is what you get then for the Wen sum. The correlation on the bottom is the level of uh, correlation uh, with the uh, uh, GQA and CSF data. The, on the left axis, you've got the, the vertical axis, you've got the land use weighting required. What it tells you is to explain the spatial patterns of your in-stream measured data. Um, you actually need to get a high level of correlation. You need to weight improved pasture quite highly. You can see the line curving up there. Uh, to a certain extent, rough grassland. You don't need to, rate, uh, to, to weight cereals particularly highly. Now, if we had time, we could go through and compare the findings uh, for these different catchments in terms of the kinds of weightings that you need. And what you find is that you get very different land use weightings required uh, for uh, different types of land use for different types of catchments. We can't generalize the importance, for instance, of, say, cereals to phosphorus across the UK because it depends on the way the catchment is filtering um, the land use uh, uh, production source pathway signal. And that's quite an important science finding as opposed to the technical finding. What we can also do uh, is compare what happens when you inverse model phosphorus uh, with the normal phosphorus model. So there's a normal phosphorus model in terms of risk, top right. Bottom left, is the inverse modeling. Now, of course, what you find when you inverse model, we're not trying at this point to separate out urban point type sources. And of course, therefore, when you do your inverse model, what you find is you largely flag up population effects. But of course, what you can then do is if you then set your urban land use weighting, you force it to be zero, you can move, remove the population effects, train the model again, um, and uh, you get, if you like, your diffuse signal. So you get a way of apportioning risk between two very different sorts uh, uh, of influence in a similar way. So if you then were convinced in this catchment um, that, or, or the initial, my initial interpretation of this is this is a catchment where there is still, and particularly down here, an urban risk. But what you can do then once you've got rid of that urban risk, if you still got, think you've got a problem, you can then look at where in the catchment you might actually want to do focus on your diffuse risks. So you can use the model in a fairly intelligent way um, to help you prioritize what needs to be done where. So if I summarize then, um, what SIMAP is, and I hope I've illustrated this to you as a risk-based model for working out where to look for diffuse pollution in catchments. That's its primary uh, goal. Works with readily available data. Um, it provides predictions down to potentially five meter resolution, because that's the resolution of the next map dem for, for Britain. At that resolution, there's a bit of noise in the elevation data, so you have to be a bit careful, but it certainly works down to, to 20 meters quite reliably. And certainly up to 2,000 kilometers square plus. The largest basin we've applied it to is about 2,200 square kilometers in the, the River Eden uh, in Cumbria. I think. We can demonstrate, and there's, of course, just a full science report that you can read to learn more about this, as well as some papers that are coming out now in the academic literature, um, demonstrate that it has signals relevant to some elements of ecology and water quality. We've not checked all of them yet. For instance, we've not done that much with the uh, ecological databases that you hold at the national level. Um, we focus on water quality databases, although we have done the Salmonid work with the in collaboration with the River Eden uh, Trust. Importantly, and I think that this is where I, I, I find SIMAP most interesting, is it can be trained with GQA data. In other words, you can actually produce quite sophisticated understandings of catchments by training it using the data that you've got. Uh, and we have included in the analysis a means of checking whether or not you've got enough GQA data to do that. Because you can show very easily by rerunning the analysis those situations where you might have a conclusion that's entirely dependent upon one data point. And that's a classic signal you haven't got enough spatial coverage of your data. Of course, you can then use that to effect, because by using that kind of signal, you can work out where you really need to go and start measuring. If you're finding four or five locations are having a big impact on your modeling predictions, but you've got no measurements there, so you can invert that solution, then you can actually design quite intelligent monitoring strategies. And then finally, um, and as I uh, intimated towards the end there, you can actually use SIMAP in an in intelligent way. And, and this, is, I think, is one of the most interesting 
areas uh, that's emerged from, from David Millage's work over the last um, uh, six months or so is this, this source potential for source apportionment uh, in an intelligent way um, by being able to run SIMAP with slightly different uh, configurations. Thank you. <laughs>